And today we have with us Erica Holst, who is the Curator of History at the Illinois State Museum. Her most recent exhibition, currently on view, is Fashing Illinois, 1820 through 1900, a collection of 19th century clothing worn by Illinois women. Uh, Erica has worked in the public history field for more than 15 years, during which time she has curated more than a dozen exhibitions. Her 2013 exhibition, Hidden in Plain Sight, in the Material World of Early Springfield, won the Illinois State Historical Society's Award for Superior Achievement. She is passionate about telling the story of people and history through material culture. Uh, before joining the Illinois State Museum, Erica served as the curator of collections at the historic Edwards Place in Springfield, Illinois, and oversaw the complete renovation of the historic house to its circa 1850s appearance while she was there. Her publications include Wicked Springfield, Crime, Corruption, and Scandal during the Lincoln Era, Edwards Place, a Springfield Treasure, and Historic Houses of Illinois Culture, as well as several scholarly and popular articles. Erica holds an MA in the, from the Winther Thur Program in Early American Culture and a BA from Illinois Wesleyan University. And so without further ado, please welcome Erica Holst. <laughs> Hi everybody, thank you so much for uh, coming out to talk a little bit about historic fashion with me. First, just out of curiosity, can I get a show of hands, has anyone been to the Illinois State Museum? Awesome, we've got two people. Well, if anyone ever finds yourself in central Illinois, um, it's worth a visit. We're right by the uh, state capitol building complex. Um, the exhibition that inspired this talk, unfortunately, has closed. I'm working on another one about uh, Generation X, though. So um, that will open in January. And we've always got new art exhibits coming through. So there's always something new to see down there. But today we're going to be talking about behind the beautiful dress, making cloth and clothing in the 19th century. Um, and as I mentioned, this was inspired by an exhibition that we had um, that featured garments that were worn during the 19th century by Illinois women. And we have this fantastic historic textiles collection that hadn't been on view before. So this exhibition was a chance to bring these dresses out in front of the public. And so I will just click through the kind of chronological highlights um, very quickly. We started in 1820. First of all, because that was our earliest garment, we just couldn't go any earlier than that. And second, because that's pretty close to 1818, the year Illinois became a state. So we thought, okay, you know, start of statehood through 1900. So you start with the kind of Regency era look here, the classic J Jane Austen, you know, high waist, um, kind of inspired by this idea of Grecian democracy and Roman Republic because we're very early in America's history and we've just successfully fought the Revolutionary War and so we're hearkening back to that inspiration of ancient Greece and Rome. This is also kind of the freest women will be just in terms of how constricting their clothes are probably for about another century. Um, women are wearing like, you know, a sort of supportive stay. It's not even a corset with whale bones. It's, it stays under there. But um, things are going to get a lot more like tight and restrained for them before they get any better. After the Regency era, waistlines gradually start to drop and the skirts gradually start to get fuller. So in the 1820s, um, you have a waist that's sort of like somewhere between a natural waist and your bust line. Skirts are starting to get fuller. This is requiring petticoats to keep that silhouette of a you know, poofy skirt. Again, this will only get worse. By the 1840s and 1850s, this is, and probably into the 1860s, this is the kind of like high water mark of um, elaborate and constricting fashion. Especially in the 1840s, there was this fashion for this really like, it's like a conical shaped torso almost. You like to have this really long waist that required this tight corset and the armholes were cut very tight and if anyone's ever had a you know top on that's got really tight sleeves around your arm you know there's not a whole lot of movement. In the 1840s um, you achieved that look of the bell-shaped skirt by lots and lots of petticoats so that's kind of like heavy and sort of hot to drag around and it corresponds with this sort of cultural ideal of women that was going on at the time 
where women, like the ideal was frankly to be sort of ornamental, you know, like you weren't supposed to be able to like run or move about because in, in a perfect world, you are a middle class lady of the house who is supervising a household. Of course, that's not the case, right? Like people come from all walks of life. People are in all different circumstances. You have, you know, women who are enslaved, women who are domestic servants, women who are factory workers, women who are working in farms. This ideal is not attainable for everyone, but still that's that's the look and kind of the, the values that are imparted through the clothes that people are wearing. By the 1850s, we have a couple of technological breakthroughs where clothing is considered. Um, first of all is the invention of the cage crinoline. And if anyone's seen Gone with the Wind and remember the scene where Scarlett's getting dressed and she puts on this like hoop thing before she puts on her petticoats, it kind of looks like a torture instrument, but it was actually a step forward from the dozen petticoats that you're wearing a decade before. This means you have, you know, maybe like two or three petticoats instead of like a zillion and you can still achieve that bell-shaped silhouette. The other technological advancement is the color purple that you see in that dress. And that dress is our famous adjacent dress. Um, this belonged to Mary Todd Lincoln's sister, Frances, who also lived in Springfield. So we like to think, you know, this dress talked to Mary Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln when was in their home. It just wasn't, you know, the Lincolns themselves. But in the 1850s, there was a British scientist who was trying um, to come up with a cure for malaria, and he was trying to synthesize quinine. And he didn't achieve quinine, but what he stumbled across instead was purple, this really beautiful, vibrant, synthetic purple color. And the application as a clothing dye quickly became apparent. Um, not great news for malaria sufferers. But still, in terms of fashion, you had like this opportunity for a purple that was vibrant and color fast. And so by the 1850s and 1860s, you see a lot of like these beautiful purple colors become very popular in clothing. The 1860s are kind of the last gasp of that like bell-shaped silhouette. Um, since we live in northern states, or you know, Illinois is a northern state, women didn't see their um, kind of economic lives disrupted as much as they would have in the south. In the south, they're very hard up. Um, there's union blockades in their ports. They're not having access to you know nice fabrics and dress goods and things that are, are being smuggled through ports are to help the war effort, not to you know help ladies' fashion. So if we were in the deep south, we would have been wearing homespun or you know turning our dresses over and over to get as much life out of them. Here in Illinois, people were still doing okay, and you know depending if you had government connections and were hooked up with contracts, some people were doing very well during the war. So you don't see the war's effect in women's fashion very much. What we do see between 1860 and 1870 is one of the most dramatic changes in women's clothing silhouettes that happens probably until the 19-teens. We go from this hoop skirts like this to where all that fullness kind of goes straight back and it's all gathered behind in a bustle. And some scholars have argued that this is a response to kind of a um, modernizing and urbanizing society, that these skirts gathered behind you are much more practical for walking down crowded city streets than a big hoop skirt. Who knows if there's anything to it? But one thing that also happened between the 1860s and the 1870s is this is when the home sewing machine really made its way into women's homes. Um, it had been patented in the 1840s. It was being manufactured in the 1850s. But for the first couple decades, they were very expensive. Um, they were huge and heavy. They tended to be found in like professional tailor shops more than in the home. By the 1860s, there's this push to market them to middle class households. They're made more affordable. There are payment plans. They've developed interchangeable parts, so if it breaks, you can kind of fix it fairly easily. And what happens is the home sewing machine was supposed to save women time on their sewing. Um, a shirt that would take 10 hours to make by hand 
hand, you could crank out in an hour and a half on a sewing machine. So this is an advantage. The downside is um, the culture at large sort of decided, well, now if you have access to a sewing machine, there's no reason why you can't embellish, embellish, embellish. So that 1870s dress with its you know lace and its ruffles and its bows and its ruches, and it's really just like more is more. And you see this like explosion of ornament on women's clothes during this time. And so really that time that was saved on, you know, the speed of sewing is now eaten up in <laughs> sewing bows on deer clothing, basically. What How are they? What uh, like a foot treadle. There's a kind of cord thing and yeah, they don't turn electric until probably into the early 20th century. Um, so in the 1880s, um, this is like fashion starts to happen sort of like faster and picks up and styles change a little bit quicker now. Um, the general look of it is sort of a plain top um, bodice and then all the visual interest tends to happen below the waist. Um, you know, like the, you've got an apron and a bustle, but during this decade the bustle like was there and then it went away and then it came back one last time and by the 1890s the bustle is gone. The 1890s has its own last gasp of sort of like fussy constricting fashions. We've got these huge leg of mutton sleeves that were popular in the 1820s and 30s and they make one big gasp in the middle of the 1890s. You also find that the the like construction of the clothes is like not it's not easy like that bodice right there has hooks and eyes here and it has hooks and eyes at the neck and there are usually flaps that hook an eye over here so it, it was kind of like the, the last wave of like constricting clothes before things sort of got simpler in the 20th century um, and then also in the 1900s you get some again weird silhouettes this is called the powder pigeon or the mono bosom look if we were to turn her to the side you'd see that she's got like a poofy kind of like bust and her rear end kind of sticks out. It was meant to be an S curve, which is like a sort of unnatural silhouette, but you know, the vagaries of fashion, that was what was in style for a while. And then finally after that, you get this kind of vertical look, and then we're into the 1920s where like everything changes. So just having run through that, just as a kind of chance to give you a real quick tour through the exhibit since it's no longer up. Before we dive into the talk, um, I'd love to just have a little bit of a discussion about this image here and unpack what's going on. So um, there's no right or wrong answers. We're just going to be talking about what we see. So does anyone want to start off and say just what do you see going on in this image? Sewing by candlelight. Sewing by candlelight. Okay, so you're noticing on the, what is this, our left hand of the screen. Yeah, there's a woman who um, she's sewing. She doesn't have really great illumination. Awesome. Okay, so you're noticing the difference between this woman on the left and the people on the right. Excellent. What else do we see? Okay, awesome. So you're thinking about the relationship between the two halves and maybe a contrast between them, like maybe our um, friend sewing by candlelight um, is definitely not as well off as the folks on the right side of the screen. She's making their clothes. <laughs> oh, awesome, yes. So you are um, kind of connecting and um, like interpolating a relationship between this woman sewing by candlelight and then all these beautiful dresses on the other side. Great. She's working and they're not. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. So you're noticing, you know, the difference in activities there and again relating to the, you know, rich versus poor, you know, leisure versus work dynamic there. Oh, neat. Yes. So, yeah, you're noticing that um, there's literally a pair of scissors kind of stabbing its way down the center of that and, and sewing implements in the middle. Oh, interesting. Great. Oh, I love that. Yeah, so you're noticing the difference in dress between the, the poor woman and the richer women and um, kind of like interpreting what that says about the environment that they're in and what kind of like 
physical comfort is available to them. Awesome, great. Also noticing the contrast between the poor woman and the rich woman, and yeah, um, and it, I kind of wonder, you know, what the quality of the fabric is too. Sort of maybe presuming that the people on the right hand side um, have like really, you know, nice, bright, colorful fabrics, and she's in this kind of drab outfit on the other side. Great. Does anyone have anything else to share? You all did phenomenally. I love the way you unpacked that. And yes, the, the kind of heart of the show is that um, when we look at beautiful clothing, um, and the reason I wanted to do this exhibit is that there's something so um, like breathtaking about them. You know, they're so beautiful and they're so well crafted compared to modern clothing. And there's something sort of romantic about it. Um, but the story of the woman who wore the garment isn't the only story like embedded in that garment. Um, the story of the people who um, made the fabric and sewed the clothing and sold the clothing, all that is wrapped up in it too. And so this talk is going to dig deeper into, you know, what's what's the cost and what's the labor behind these beautiful clothes. Yes. The Probably. Um, I get asked a lot how, how many outfits a typical woman had, and it's really kind of hard to pin down. Um, like, a kind of middle class woman might have had, like, say, 10 different dresses. Um, women of really limited means might have had, like, two, you know, your church dress and your other dress. And so, um, yeah, she probably would have been wearing that all day, and it probably would have been, you know, like, patched and mended and, and kept going, whereas maybe the women on the right are, you know, like, get a new dress every season or up with the latest fashions. Is she working in the field in that dress? Or is that something that she could be doing? Um, she, I, and I'm, I'm reading into this, you know, um, this is, you know, an illustration. I don't think it's tied to a real person, but my sense from this image is that she was um, one of the urban poor, and so she would have probably been at that all day, you know? So, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about who tended to be um, seamstresses who, who sewed for money. But that's an excellent point. Okay, so basically this reiterates what I just said, that we're gonna um, explore the human cost behind the growing accessibility of fashion because a trend that runs through the 19th century and through the 20th century is that clothes become less expensive and more accessible, um, but nothing's ever free, right? Like someone is paying a cost somewhere and where, where does that cost land? So we're going to start from the very beginning um, to cloth in early America. And after the talk, I invite you to please come and um, touch the fabrics up here. Uh, this exhibit first opened way back. It was supposed to open in March of 2020, if that tells you anything. And we had all these really fun, touchable interactives planned. And they all got packed away. And so they just sit in a box in my desk. So I love it when people can actually touch things. Um, you had uh, four main fabrics in early America. You had um, the plant fiber based ones, cotton and flax, and then you had the animal fiber based um, fabrics, wool and silk. And of course, you could mix and match the two, but what you don't have is any synthetics here. So in early America, I'm actually defining as like pre revolutionary war, like colonial America. Um, we think of our colonial forebears as sort of living these um, like very self-sufficient rural lives where, you know, everything that you need, you make on your own farm. And that's actually not the case, especially where textiles are considered. Um, a lot of American textiles are imported from Europe and Asia. Basically, all of them have a kind of global source. And especially if you're living in, you know, a coastal city, if you're living a little bit more inland or on a, in a farm type of situation, um, you probably would be 
um, weaving your own cloth, but there was certainly the option to purchase. It's not like there was no other cloth in America. And actually, um, America couldn't produce enough yardage of fabric to clothe its citizens. So importation was sort of a necessity. And so um, the European countries and China were actually ahead in terms of an industry, textile industry. And so Americans had access to linen produced in Scotland, Ireland, England, wool in England, cotton produced in India or later grown in India and woven in England, silk produced in China or England. So again, instead of, you know, people isolated on their farms, they're actually plugged into this like global economic network. And so in terms of homespun cloth, which certainly was um, being produced, and especially during the American Revolution, when people really weren't keen to be importing cloth from Britain or buying anything that was coming off of British ships. So you had this sort of surge of homespun. Um, linen was kind of the most common cloth that was made at home. It was very inexpensive in terms of like dollars and cents or shillings and pounds or whatever to make, but labor intensive. So if you're gonna make linen, you have to like plant the crop and then wait for it to mature and then harvest it and pull it and ripple and red it. So red it is soak it in water to break down that wooden stalk on the outside and then um, break it. These women with these sticks are actually like breaking that stalk and then you're going to take it and um, scutch it and scutching is like running the stick along it and hackling is taking the linen fibers and pulling it what looks through like something that like you know a fraternity would use for hazing like nails sticking up where you're going to drag it through there and all the woody wooden flakes are going to come off and you're going to be left with a fiber and then spin and then weave so from the time you put the seeds in the ground to where you get a shirt that you can wear it takes about like 18 months and this is what you get if you're making um, homespun cloth and I do have an example I've got some homespun linen here, so please come up and feel it. Like, this is not a luxury fabric. It's a very utilitarian fabric. And some, you know, you could, you could be, you could spin finer or rougher, and it was possible to achieve a, you know, pretty fine quality homespun. But in general, it's pretty, like, you know, it's kind of coarse. It's not like you're getting this, like, super soft silk dress or anything. Um, and this was made by a woman who lived in southern Illinois in the 1850s named Susanna Watson, and she raised the sheep that went into the cotton, she raised the linen, and she blended the linen and cotton together to form um, Lindsay Woolsey fabric. It used to do linen and wool for Lindsay Woolsey, and cotton replaced it, but they still called it Lindsay Woolsey. Um, she dyed this fabric herself, and she made the dress herself. And when you look at it closely, or if we were in person, you'd see that, like, she is a competent seamstress. She's not an expert seamstress. You can probably see that the collar doesn't quite match here. And she started with buttons that were about this far apart, and then they kind of, like, scrunched down together at the end. So, you know, this isn't, like, high fashion, but this is a good, sturdy work dress for the farm. So it did its job for her. So um, after the revolution, things opened up in America. So when America was a colony, our job was to send natural resources to England, who would process them and turn them into goods, and they would send them back and we would buy them. So um, <laughs> works like double awesome for England and we're kind of like paying twice on the American end. And so England was really not interested in America developing industry at all. We were supposed to be consumers of British products, not makers of them ourselves. But with the American Revolution being over, there's no more laws, there's no more taxes, there's no more regulation, and so America is wide open for industry. This doesn't mean that Britain's like, great, here's how you build a factory. You know, they're still trying to like <laughs> keep America kind of at bay and keep us dependent as consumers as long as they can. But Americans go over to England and they basically commit like industrial espionage. They take tours of factories. They, you know, make notes. They smuggle out plans if they can. And within like um, a couple of years of the revolution ending, you have our first spinning factory being established in Rhode Island. 
And then in 1814, um, the first textile factory, which is spinning and weaving in Massachusetts. And by 1860, there's more than 878 textile factories in New England. And so these factories um, first try to adapt what's called the British system of factory work. And so the British system is um, picture like Charles Dickens and like whatever grim, you know, like urban factory setting comes to mind. And it's basically that. Um, British factories tended to hire whole families, so like men, women, and children. A um, lot of like child labor, long hours, unsafe conditions, unhealthy conditions, um, not a lot of agency for uh, the workers. And so America tried to replicate this, but it was really hard to take hold in a country where you literally can purchase land for $1.25 an acre. You know, like who wants to go work in a factory on someone else's schedule for someone else's wages when you could get land and be your own boss and kind of have your own independent stake in the world? So um, Henry, what's his name, Henry Francis? Francis Cabot Lowell um, develops what he calls the Lowell system. And he's trying to solve this problem of not being able to hire you know, young men for his factories by recruiting the unmarried daughters of Yankee <coughs> farmers to work in his mills. And so in some ways, this seems like a really good solution because you have a group of young women who um, are working on these farms, they don't have a lot of avenues for employment. You know, they might hire themselves out to be a hired hand on another farm, like for domestic work or something. Um, maybe they could become teachers, but really there's not a lot of ways for young women to own or earn money. Um, so Lowell offers them by giving them a chance to work in the factories, a chance to earn money, um, a little bit of economic independence. They lived at the factory, so they're boarding in dorms. There's like dorm mothers, you know, they're supervised and chaperoned. There's opportunities to attend church, to attend classes and Sunday schools and create literary magazines. They're supposed to come away from their experience working in the mills, um, enriched both in their pockets and in their kind of like development as people, and then most of them go on to marry and, um, you know, take care of their own households. They're not like career factory women. And so this works for a while, um, but after a while there's like economic conditions that weigh on the factories. There's a glut of the, you know, we said like 878 textile mills, like how much cloth can America buy, right? Like there's sort of this surplus. Um, <coughs> excess supply, not enough demand, which drives down the cost, which drives down wages, and you have factories, you know, shutting down and people getting laid off, not to mention their unhealthy conditions. You have workers, like, sped up, being asked to work more hours. Um, you were supposed to be 15 to work in Lowell's Mills, but he looked the other way if you were, like, 12. Um, and eventually, women are like, no, no more, you know, so they start to strike, um, and it becomes less of this, like, coveted job or win-win situation, and more of a job that young women turn to um, out of more dire necessity, and it becomes a job that immigrant women tend to fill. Um, there's a wave of Irish and German immigrants in the 1840s and 50s who kind of take over these factory jobs, and that's to get a toehold in America, you know, secure some economic independence, and their long-term goal is they want to leave the factory too, and they definitely don't want their kids to be there. So the factory um, sort of depends on the labor of, you know, people who are kind of just struggling. It's not, it's not like a, a, you know, support your family on this career type of thing. So we're going to turn our attention. We've uh, we've looked at the female labor that's involved in spinning yarn and creating cloth. Yes. That's 1911, and that's actually at the end of our story. But I'm glad you brought that up. That's good foreshadowing. We'll get there too. <laughs> So now we're going to talk about the um, clothing production, which we can't really talk about with addressing the production of cotton in America and the toll that it took on laborers. So um, prior to the cotton gin being invented, cotton wasn't really like a viable 
crop for mass production because you hit a bottleneck in cleaning it. People could grow it fast enough, they could harvest it fast enough, but the like process of actually picking the seeds out of the cotton slowed everything way down. Um, it could, but when you invented the, the cotton gin, when Eli Whitney um, took his tour of the South and came away with this idea, um, the cotton gin could clean as much cotton in one day as it would take a person to clean by hand in a year. And so now you've got this young country that's like ripe for, you know, there's all these textile factories, right? Like the, the if you can grow the cotton to supply these factories in the United States and still in England, um, you are sitting on a gold mine. So this really changes the economics of the United States. And we have the rise of King Cotton. And so what had been going on in the United States is um, in your upper, like kind of mid-Atlantic um, enslaving states, the primary um, crops had been tobacco for a long time. But by the 1800s, tobacco had really like worn out the soil, right? It's no longer as productive. And farmers there are shifting their agricultural pursuits away from tobacco and this kind of, you know, plantation labor heavy system to like wheat and cattle and things that didn't rely as much on forced labor. So you have this time when the country's kind of like teetering on like, do we even really need, still need slavery and like, just at the wrong time, um, the cotton gin is invented and cotton becomes extremely lucrative as a crop. And so these lower states here, your Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, um, Arkansas is like prime cotton growing land here. And so you have um, a forced migration of enslaved people from the upper south to the lower south, from working on um, tobacco farms, um, hemp farms, to working on cotton plantations, which is a really much more like brutal environment. And it's no accident that the land that's the prime cotton growing land um, happens to be the land that's affected by the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which again, uh, forced migration of thousands of indigenous peoples off their land. Um, this is because, like to put it bluntly, there was a bunch of dudes who had dollar signs in their eyes who um, felt that that land could be better used making them a fortune than um, being in the hands of indigenous people. And so indigenous people paid the price by being forced off of it. And uh, white planters moved in and brought with them enslaved labor. And so the cotton economy essentially controlled the destiny of about 4 million enslaved people in the United States. And we sort of like give ourselves a pass in northern states like, oh, that was the South, you know, that wasn't our problem. Um, really, the entire country was kind of wrapped it up in it um, because you have, of course, the Southern planters who are like the literal enslavers, but you've got a whole lot of people making money or benefiting from it. Um, you've got New England textile mills who are spinning the cotton. You've got Northern bankers who are giving mortgages to Southern plantations and Northern merchants who are sending it across the sea to England to be spun. And of course, you've got American consumers who are like buying cheap cotton now and not spending a year and a half of their lives um, like doing the whole linen, you know, breaking, harvesting thing. So when we look at this uh, cotton dress here, um, what we might see are like lots of layers. Like we might see it and think about the woman who wore it and she has benefited from inexpensive cotton in her life. This is a fashion that is not possible if you don't have cheap textiles, right? Like she's got yards and yards of fabric in there. So she is able to like keep up with this really kind of decadent style. And she's got this wonderful pattern that's made possible because um, someone has invented roller prints for cotton to achieve these like very colorful and varied prints that just aren't possible from um, block printing or um, dying at home. But you've also got um, labor that's hidden in there. You most certainly got the enslaved labor of whoever was harvesting the cotton. And on top of that, you've got the um, factory labor of whoever spun this into yarn and then wove it into fabric. So um, just to say that everything's, everything's complicated and there's a lot of threads woven together. Yes. Is the lace imported or made here? That I do not know. Um, I know that Massachusetts had a fairly thriving lace industry, so it could have been made here, but it might have been imported as well. 
Okay, so these are some of the ways that cotton changed Americans' relationship to textiles. Factory-made cotton supplanted homespun linen. So again, we talked about how um, homespun linen is very inexpensive in terms of your dollars, but very expensive in terms of your labor. And every person who's working with a household budget has to make these kind of day-by-day -day decisions, right? Like, do I want to pick up takeout tonight or do I want to spend an hour making my family a dinner, you know? And, and it factored in here, too. And how people ended up breaking was they would rather spend the money on cotton goods, especially as they became less and less expensive, than spend the time to create them. So Americans became consumers, not producers of cloth. Um, we talked about um, it changed women's fashions. Those like mid 19th century, like huge hoop skirt, very like you know fabric heavy things, aren't possible if you're like weaving cloth at home yourself, or if cloth is very expensive to buy. This is kind of like a like conspicuous consumption, like decadence. Like we're swimming in fabric, so let's just make our clothes as like you know big and poofy as possible, kind of thing. Um, and then the availability of cotton also changed the way that people made clothing. And I'll um, put a pin in that. I'm going to back up and talk just a little bit about how clothing was made. And then we'll return to the impact that um, cotton production had on the way clothing was made. So throughout the 18th century for men and most of the 19th century, all clothing was made for somebody, not anybody, which is to say all your clothes are basically custom made to your body. And this was one of the um, challenges and kind of fun things about mounting an exhibit of historic clothing was that we had all these dresses and each dress was like a perfect silhouette of the woman who used to wear them. So we had a very limited budget. I was buying these cheapy um, mannequins off of Etsy for $100 a piece, and then I had to shape the mannequin to fit the dress, and they were all different. And a lot of times that involved me taking an electric knife and carving the styrofoam out of its waist because the waists were all too big, but then I'd have to, you know, pad out a hip or pad out a bust or something to create, you know, the exact dimensions of the woman who wore it. <laughs> So women basically had, um, I say two choices, there's actually kind of a hybrid third choice that most women did, but you could make your garments by hand or you could hire a dressmaker to make your garments for you. And both women, most women actually did both. Um, if you made clothing at home, it was because clothing was a universal skill for women. And there is this wonderful um, quote in a domestic advice manual where she says that a woman who doesn't know how to sew is as deficient in her education as a man who cannot write. Um, if you were a little girl, you'd get a needle put in your hand at age four or five, and then it would be your job to help your mom with the mending and make clothes for your doll, and eventually you're making sheets or pillowcases or garments for yourself. So women generally took care of things like their personal linens, like this chemise up there, um, their children's clothing, especially when they're young, and their husband's shirts. If you're going into something a little bit more complicated, you would hire a dressmaker. And dressmaking was a skilled profession, and this is kind of like the top of the economic pyramid if you're a working woman in the 19th century. Um, dressmakers went beyond seamstresses. A dressmaker was responsible for keeping track of the latest fashion, um, adapting that fashion to your client's kind of tastes and needs and budget. Um, you would get the precise fit um, of a bodice and you know all those roughly details, you would kind of like master them. And so a successful dressmaker um, might have a shop of her own with people working for her, or she might be um, something of a journeyman where she would go from client's house to client's house and stay for a few days to a couple weeks and kind of do their sewing while she was there. And while she was there, she was treated like a guest. She was put up in a guest bedroom. She was called Miss or Mrs. She wasn't treated like, you know, the help. She was kind of treated peer to peer. And what most women actually did was create their own, um, like, you know, things like undergarments like we looked at in the previous screen, they'd hire a dressmaker if they, you know, needed a wedding dress or a ball gown or something elaborate. And when the dressmaker came, they might actually help them out by, you know, cutting, cutting out fabric themselves or helping to base things together. So it's sort of this symbiotic relationship. 
You know, that's an excellent question. <sighs> I'm assuming in the early days it was all done by hand, by hand just because there was no sewing machine, but I don't know if... I don't know about that because it seems clunky to travel with the sewing machine. Yeah. But it was faster. Yeah. It was faster, yeah. But I don't know if your client, you expect your clients to furnish you a sewing machine, you know, and set you up. No? Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so how the cotton economy affected the making of clothing. Um, the cotton industry um, spurred the development of the ready-made clothing industry because there were so many textile factories and there was so much yardage being produced and there's only so many yards of cotton that an American family needs, right? Like for this to be viable, um, it needed to be turned into another product that people wanted to consume. And so that product, logically, um, one of them was clothing. And it started in men's clothing. So um, in colonial times, there was sort of a stigma to not having a custom-made garment. Um, you might see a, like, sort of ready, and by ready-made, I mean, like, someone, like, kind of whips out a general garment that could kind of fit everyone. It doesn't have a precise fit. You might see that on sailors or, um, you know, on some working-class individuals, but it was kind of seen as, like, a... a whatever the opposite of status is, you know, like you are, you're not in a custom suit and so this is kind of like revealing of your place kind of on the lower end of society. Well, after the revolution, there's this kind of evolution in thinking and this rise of the idea of, you know, the, the self-made man where all you need is the um, willingness to work and everyone can rise in society and suddenly there's like no stigma if you're buying kind of ready-made clothes. And men's clothes were easier to mass produce than women's clothes. Um, like especially shirts and pants are a little more straightforward than say like a woman's very fitted bodice. So you start to have um, the rise of mass produced clothing and this is in the 1820s is when it takes off. And the sewing machine is still a couple decades away. So how are we mass producing clothing if we don't have like, you know, machinery to do it? There are two answers. Um, one of them is the standardization of tailoring methods. So, um, you know, prior to the 1820s, you would go and meet with your tailor, um, and he would take like 50 different measurements here and here and here and here and get you that really precise fit. There have developed these kind of like um, proportional systems where if you took like 10 measurements and did a certain amount of math and like you could calculate out all the other measurements and this kind of sped things up and saved time. But the big reason you were able to mass produce clothing was that um, tailors then replaced skilled male and female workers with unskilled labor, usually that of women and children. Um, and when we say unskilled, we're talking about women with exceptional hand sewing skills, but because every woman was supposed to have hand sewing skills, it didn't count as a skill, that counted as unskilled. And so you have women who um, are sewing by hand, and they worked on what was called the putting out system. You would have these merchant tailors who would um, assemble pre-cut bundles of fabric, and these women seamstresses would pick them up, go to their home. That woman that we saw working by candlelight um, would be sewing this you know, in her own home, um, on her own time, paying for her own fire and candles and things like that, and then returning the finished product to the tailor. And so um, she might have sewn 20,000 stitches to make a shirt, working 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week, and take home 75 cents to $1.12 at the end of the week. And the reason this was possible is because um, there was a supply of labor to draw from. If you are a woman in the 19th century who has small children to support, let's say your husband has passed away or left you, um, you can't go get a factory job and leave your kids unsupervised at home. You need to be home with you. And sewing was one thing, you know, you have the skills, you're born and bred with these sewing skills, and it's something that you can do to make money while remaining at home with your dependents. Yes? I don't know. Um, yeah, let's see. Well, if you're making six to nine, let's say you, you know, it costs 
let's say a dime to make a shirt, I would say they'd probably sell it for a quarter or 50 cents or, you know, I'm assuming there's a huge markup and that money is not making its way to the person who's actually sewing it. But that's a good question. I'm sure that could be found in an advertisement somewhere. Um, so we talked about the putting out system. Um, this slide is a little out of order. So there she is in her, um, you know, kind of quarters there where the plaster's crumbling and it's probably not as warm as in the ballroom and maybe her um, children are, you know, asleep in a bed just out of the frame here working into the night to support them. Um, and then you have the sewing machine come in and this transforms the industry again. So um, on the one hand, um, you have the opportunity for inside work, factory work. Um, you have um, industrialists who will buy up a whole bunch of sewing machines and open a factory where you bring in labor to sew on the machines you know, for a wage and go home at the end of the day. And this becomes an attractive option for, again, unmarried female or people without dependents at home who can you know, leave the house and they're not responsible for anyone during the day and come home with their wages at the end of the day. And there's incentive to this because um, sewing machine operators are actually considered um, more skilled than hand sewers. It's like a skill to operate this machine. And so they're like paid accordingly, you know, they're, they're paid more money. On the same like, you know, level there, you've still got your seamstresses and now they're in competition with machines who can sew much more quickly and much more evenly than they can by hand. And so a lot of hand sewers um, were just kind of put out of business. Um, there were occasionally options of you could buy your own machine, you could rent a machine, but if that's not an option for you, um, you know, you spending 10 hours a day on a shirt that someone else is cranking out in an hour isn't like a successful business model. And then the sewing machine gave rise to the sweatshop. So, um, you know, kind of the step down between the bright, clean factory with all the girls happily sewing their hoop skirts here, um, and especially happens in urban areas, is um, anyone can be a middleman in the garment industry. And all it takes is a couple machines and some very inexpensive um, rental space. And so you set up your machines, you bring in, again, it's typically immigrant labor, people who are just arrived in the United States and are looking to get an economic toehold and are willing to work hard for low wages. Um, and because it's a subcontractor, there's less accountability there. You know, you've got a guy who can basically disappear, you know, and set up shop in another set of rented rooms somewhere else. And he's not super accountable in terms of like, the health and safety, you know, how many people are in a room, what conditions they're working under, how many hours people are working under. So it's sort of this like, you know, ripe situation for a labor exploitation here. And so now we get into the sweatshirt, sweatshop, or the shirtwaist and the sweatshop. And the shirtwaist comes about in the later 19th century, um, becomes popular in the 1880s to 1890s. And on the one hand, this is um, a symbol of women's economic independence. It's a shirt that's literally modeled off of a man's shirt. And it becomes sort of the unofficial uniform for women who are starting to work more and more outside the household. Um, after the Civil War, you have the rise of women filling roles like secretaries and bookkeepers. And um, wearing clothes that are a little bit easier to wear, like you have a blouse and a skirt, which is kind of, you know, mix and match separates, which are an easier look to maintain than like a full on, you know, dress. So you have that aspect of it, but like the other side of it is the person who's making the um, shirt waist is oftentimes a woman working in a sweatshop um, under unsafe conditions who is um, being underpaid and overworked. So there's like both economic independence and exploitation, you know, packed into one um, complicated garment there. So what is behind the beautiful dress? Um, like I said, it's complicated. Um, there could be exploited labor. Um, probably a lot of times there was exploited labor. Um, if it's a cotton garment, there's probably enslavement baked into it. Um, if you're a dressmaker who made this dress and made a fair profit off of it and you're supporting yourself, there's opportunity and independence. 
if you're a woman who is wearing the latest style and you love this dress and you're really proud of it, um, there's access to fashion and kind of pride of ownership. Or um, it probably all women felt a sense of like drudgery because sewing was a part of their lives that never went away. You know, there was always mending to do. There was always something to make. It's something that, you know, you just kind of can't escape. All of that and any of that could be in any garment. And so we're going to carry um, forward. I know the talk is uh, framed in the 19th century, but we're going to carry forward into the 20th century just a little bit um, because the postscript is interesting. And I do want to connect it to the clothes we wear today because most of us in our lifetimes have lived through a sort of mini revolution in the way that clothing is produced and consumed. So um, the garment workers start to organize starting in the um, very late 19th century into the 20th century. And this is an amazing feat for labor, if you think about it. Um, it's not like everyone's working in one factory and can stop by the water cooler and be like, hey, do you feel like we're being underpaid? Like, yeah, me too. There's, you know, maybe like five women in this sweatshop and a hundred over here and 50 over here, and they're, you know, different pockets of different factories and sweatshops scattered throughout the city, and women often working, you know, 10 to 12 hour days, so there's not a lot of like leisure time. So the fact that women did find the time to connect with each other and build this network and come together for common good is like super remarkable. And so they organized um, strikes and marches and pickets and really heightened awareness about the conditions that they were laboring under. Um, and the shirt, the Triangle Shirtwaist um, factory fire was um, like, you know, it's a horrible tragedy and it really shone a light onto the conditions that these women were suffering under. You know, it was this like super unsafe factory where they locked the doors and, you know, so many women died and they, I mean, they, they were the ones that died, but a lot of women were working under similar conditions. And so all the press actually like elevated in the national consciousness, the fact like, oh my gosh, you know, where are our clothes coming from and who's working to um, create them? So finally, in the 1930s, um, part of the New Deal included the um, Fair Labor Standards Act. And so the United States strengthened its labor laws with regards to how many hours could be worked, um, how old you had to be to work, established a fair minimum wage, um, which really kind of like boosted conditions for American factory workers. So we're going to fast forward to where our clothing is made today. And if anyone has access to like a tag at the back of their shirt or, you know, can look at it and um, can see where your clothing's made, I cut the tags out of my shirts because uh, they itch the back of my neck. But I know my shoes were made in China. Yeah, so that's, that's the follow-up is what happened as these clothes started to be mass produced. And of course, that only continued into the 20th century. And the 20th century is the transitional time where women are holding on to their sewing skills for you know quite a while through the 20th century but ready-made clothing becomes more and more available and gradually that calculus begins to tilt again in favor of it's cheaper and easier to buy it than to invest the time into it and so we're all pretty much now consumers of clothing and um, my generation is the one where we stopped sewing um, not not in every case I still you know I have some friends my age who do know how to sew but my mom grew up knowing how to sew knit mend and she didn't especially like it it was just something she felt like she had to do and she didn't teach it to me for whatever reason and so I like think about this like unbroken chain of needlework skills that probably goes back a thousand years in the women in our family like that stops dead with me because I didn't get those skills but you know this is where we're at where we you know buy and in response to the the fashion industry has like sped things up and sped things up and it used to be you know you bought like spring summer clothes and then there was fall winter clothes there's two seasons of clothes and the clothes for a long time in the 20th century are still like pretty like good quality, right? You get your like wool and synthetic material and then we get polyester coming in and like the 60s and stuff. And now we are in the era of um, fast fashion. And now we've got like 52 micro seasons a year where if we go to someplace like H&M and Zara, you know, there's always something new. And we as consumers are trained to want 
like latest shiny, new, you know, trendy. Um, the clothes are often kind of like inexpensive quality, like not great made, not great fabrics. And we're sort of supposed to not care because it was cheap and, you know, if it gets a hole, we'll throw it away and we'll buy something else that's trendy. And that like keeps the machinery going, right? Like someone is making money off of us continuing to buy clothes. Um, and that system works. Again, there's no such thing as like cheap clothes really because someone is paying the price and the way that fas fashion works is they've outsourced all the factories to the places we mentioned on our tags, China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and what those countries all have in common um, is really like lax labor laws or non-existent labor laws. So that's some place where a um, clothing brand can subcontract out and subcontract out again and subcontract out again to a clothing producer in Bangladesh who um, is forcing his laborers to work overtime um, practically against their will, who is denying maternity leave, who is not paying a living wage, who's housing his workers in unsafe conditions. And when that gets back to, you know, oh, the Gap, like, uses sweatshops, the Gap says, no, 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 you know, like, I, we subcontracted out, we have no control, we won't work with that contractor anymore, so they'll move their contractor to another person who's, you know, just as exploitative. So um, we're going to leave with like reflection on our closets. Um, do you ever make or mend clothing? And what stories does your clothing tell? And I also want to follow up by asking like, how has your you know shopping slash making mending clothing experience changed either like in your lifetime or in the lifetime of you know family that you can recall? Thank you so much. Exactly fantastic. Thank you.